latest up-to-date coverage near you. News 12, on your side, breaking news. Just one week until Richmond County starts the new year, and tonight the school board is talking last-minute changes. Right, it seems like everything is fluid this year, and no decision is final yet, but that may be the case later tonight. Nick Poto joins us live in our studio with more about tonight's meeting that's going on as we speak. Like you said, that meeting going on right now. Dr. Bradshaw giving his recommendations to the board, and they are expected to vote later. But, he, but one thing he did want to highlight was the numbers in Richmond County. He said he was very pleased with what he's seen so far. Back on August 1st, we had 780 coronavirus cases in Richmond County. Now, as of August 31st, that number down to 423, something he was pleased with, as I said. He sent out, uh, or excuse me, uh, in, in the Richmond County school system, there are 4,100 employees, and there are 95 employees who have tested positive for coronavirus, 63 of them currently in quarantine. Now, Dr. Bradshaw said they still will have enough employees to fully staff both virtual and in-person learning. They sent out a teacher survey to all 800, 1,872 teachers, got about 61% to respond. About 48% say they were either somewhat or very comfortable with the assignment that they were given, whether that be face-to-face, -face, virtual, or some combination of the two. And about 38% they were, said they were either somewhat or very uncomfortable with the assignment they were given. 78% of the teachers said they had adequate resources that they needed to teach this upcoming school year. Another quick percentage for you, 54% of students did choose virtual learning. That's just shy of 16,000 students. All that being said, Dr. Bradshaw then went ahead and gave his recommendations. He says schools should start September 8th for pre-K through 5th grade and for K through 8th grade schools, and then September 10th for grades 6 to 12. Then he wants to have a... Uh, progress report, he said, three weeks later on September 29th, and especially call it board meeting, just to kind of update with how everything's been going for those first three weeks. He says, in order to remain open, schools are going to follow the Department of Public Health and the State Board of Education guidelines. He says, if a school has a 10% absentee rate, that's something they'll monitor every day, how many students and staff do not come in. If a school passes 10%, they will shut down that school. And in terms of classroom percentages, uh, if a student has coronavirus, they will shut down that classroom for some cleaning. Again, these are just recommendations. The board is still discussing, and that vote is expected to come later. It is all on the table tonight. Nick, thanks very much. A sigh of relief for teachers across Georgia last night. Governor Brian Kemp extending his order on coronavirus restrictions, something he did not do, reclassify teachers as critical workers. The federal government just recently added educators to the list, making it easier to exempt teachers from quarantine if they're ever exposed. A Kemp spokesperson says the governor is still weighing that option. So weather now, very hot, humid outside, and the Riley, thanks a lot. New this evening, nursing homes across South Carolina will soon be able to allow loved ones to visit patients again. DHEC and Governor McMaster issuing extensive guidelines today. The last thing that any of us here or any of you want to see is for visitation in any nursing home or facility to be temporarily suspended because of an outbreak. But we can prevent that. We can do this. That's why it's important, vitally important, that family members and loved ones follow each and every one of these requirements. So here are the rules for a facility to offer limited outdoor visitation, screenings of residents for any symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Faculty has adequate staffing and PPE, and there have been no cases among staff and residents in the facility within the last 14 days. The news comes as a hopeful sign for families who've waited almost seven months to see loved ones who live in nursing homes. As News 12, 12's Will Rio explains, local facilities and families are ready to get the ball rolling, but with health as the top priority. Nursing homes around the country and right here at home are still restricting who comes in and who comes out. And even as restrictions may be lifted, what does opening back up look like for them? I spoke with one woman who says she just wants to hug her grandmother one more time. I do sometimes if she's asleep, I don't even knock on the window. I just look at her to be sure she's there, she's okay, and then, and then I leave. Hope that she's there the next time I go back to the window. This is the reality. It has been for many families over the past six months, separated by glass and unable to do the simplest things. She turned 89 years old 
that's the first birthday she's ever had that we weren't actually, you know, with her. Kelly Wilkerson says the last time she was sitting next to her grandmother was March 12th. The separation is, is heartbreaking. But now, visitations may finally be allowed again. But with very strict rules, South Carolina will soon allow long-term care facilities to hold outdoor visitations. And one Aiken facility says they're looking to do this very soon. Hopefully our timeline goal is going to be two weeks to start doing the outside visits. Some of DHEC's guidelines include no physical contact, only two visitors at a time, and no confirmed cases in the last 14 days. Cheatham says they don't mind strict precautions if it's what's best in the long run. When it was just a recommendation, we did that because if we knew that if we did the best that they were wanting us to do, that was going to be a step closer to getting the facility open for visitation. Cheatham says they want to be mindful of their residents' health. Our oldest resident is going to be 101 in October and she has one living daughter and her visiting is now watching her pick up her laundry from the front door window. But for this granddaughter, as soon as she gets the okay, she'll be there. I'd be there on the front porch waiting for them to unlock the door. Whether it's today, if it were an hour from now, I would I would be there. Will Rio, on your side. A lot of families already. Let's check the cases across the two states this evening. 2,200 new positives today with 105 more deaths in Georgia. That's a slight uptick as new cases have stayed below 2,000 for about a week now. Just under 800 new cases in South Carolina today, 38 new deaths in the state. That's two days in a row with cases under 1,000 after Saturday and Sunday both saw more than 1,000 new cases. Here at home, 59 new cases across our local hospitals. 55 of them are at AU Health as total cases there get closer to 8,300. University Hospital stands at just over 1,300 cases. Only one new case to, to report at Doctors Hospital. Aiken Regional sits, sits at 633, and three new cases at the Charlie Norwood VA. New this evening, we're learning bulletproof vests were ordered for all Augusta Code Enforcement officers. It came out in a heated debate during today's commission meeting, and it might not be the only change headed to the, that city department. This comes after a code enforcement officer was shot and killed about two weeks ago. He was posting a sign to a condemned home. Now leaders are talking new protection and a new process for the city workers that respond to problematic properties, even considering if the department altogether should no longer be managed by the Augusta Planning Office, but instead the Marshal's Office. Well, there is uh, some possible discussion on arming the code enforcement agents, agents. Uh, then you have to look at uh, the safety requirements and the legal requirements to allow them to carry a weapon and a variety of other different things as to how we can make it safer. Ultimately, commission decided to table plans for new rules. They chose to set a committee meeting to talk further with law enforcement. Augusta Commission wants to honor its late utilities director, Tom Weedmeyer. The director died last month from COVID, and today leaders voted to consider renaming the utilities building after him. This is not a done deal, but commissioners agreed to begin reviewing the plan. I know required rules for changing the name of this office on Walker Street. $1.4 million, that's how much money Augusta commissioners voted to give paying college today. It would come from CARES Act money. The city says they still expect to get an extra $7.2 million in CARES dollars to spend on community needs. The $1.4 million to pay would only be approved based on conditions. The city's law department will set those terms of spending for the school. In South Carolina, lawmakers now have a better idea of how the... Also today, a powerful tribute from the man who played his cousin on the big screen, actor Michael B. Jordan, the latest celebrity to pay respects to his late... Black Panther co-star Chadwick Boseman. In his Instagram post, Jordan says Boseman's legacy will live on forever, and he's dedicating the rest of his days to live the way Chadwick did. Boseman's death from cancer is sparking a national conversation. He died of colon cancer at age 43, a situation that seems rare. But as Brady Trapville found, it's a growing concern. Get a colonoscopy after you turn 50. That's always been the golden rule. But doctors say that may be changing as they find more cases in younger people. A shining light in Hollywood is now shining a light on a life-saving issue. Yeah, I wouldn't say I was surprised because I, I have seen this happen many a time. Dr. Satish Rao, a gastroenterologist at AU, says he's seen colon cancer kill a 34-year-old nurse he used to work with. Nobody should be dying from this disease at this day and age because we have very good screening tools Unfortunately, not many people pay attention to the screening guidelines. 
especially in Georgia. The recommendation is we should come up to about 70-80% of the population we should have screened, but we are really in the 40-50% range. But when should you get screened? The American Cancer Society now says age 45. Research at AU is showing it's even earlier. It became very clear that we have to lower this to 40 years now for African Americans. And 45 for everyone else. CDC data shows African Americans and men are more susceptible. We do see um, differences in socioeconomic status, incomes over a period of a year, which might change our diet which might change our access to health care. Dr. Rocky Karaj is a gastroenterologist at University Hospital. She recommends staying away from processed meats and paying close attention to family history. A life lost too soon is an opportunity to have a tough conversation. This is nothing to be embarrassed about. It's, it's life-saving. Health officials I spoke to say the rule with detecting any sort of cancer is, of course, screening. So don't wait until life calms down or COVID goes away to get tested. Reporting in Augusta, Brady Trapnell on your side. Some of you know I lost a sister to colon cancer, so my family is very aware of these screenings. And in some ways, it is the easiest test you'll ever have because, you know what, you sleep right through it. Doctors say if a direct family member gets colon cancer, you should get screened 10 years earlier than them if possible. Riley? Well, the headlines going in for